view. Ready? Yeah, okay, we are live right now. Good evening, everybody. I'm Roberto Reale, as you know, I am the president and the founder of Utopian, uh, a nonprofit organization based in Rome. And we have tonight uh, Bas Bosma. Bosma. Sorry, Bas, but I never could uh, learn Dutch till now. <laughs> you know, it's Bas Bosma. Bas is a very, very well no um, global, uh, I mean, uh, global recognized authority on smart cities. Uh, is the author of a very well-known book about that, A New Digital Deal, and we'll talk later about that. And he, he also is the, um, I mean, is professor, uh, and um, professor at the, um, at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at the Arizona State University. And he, I don't know if right now, Bas, you are also serving at, uh, as uh, Chief Innovation Officer at Change. Uh, was that a previous, oh, right now? Oh, that's also okay. a current position. Okay, okay. And um, Bas uh, is also involved in the, uh, I mean, in an Italian, an Italian uh, organization. Um, in the Smart City field. Uh, he is a board member of the Smart City Association Italy. Uh, but thank you for being here. We also have Flavio Marzano who connected, who joining us right now. Oh, I, tell I, us. I, thank you, thank you for Good being here. You, and um, why, why uh, do we to talk about Smart Cities again? Uh, because we are, uh, the very uh, moment, I think, uh, where uh, a large flow of public resources will uh, go to the member states in you know, the, the EU, especially Italy, but not only Italy. And we need to, and we need to understand how to, uh, you know, uh, how to allocate them in a wise way. Uh, but not only that, we are still um, struggling with the pandemic, and the pandemic has changed has changed everything. Of course, changed the way we are. We, we we do everything. The, the way we we move around, the way we we go to work. We don't go to work anymore, maybe, or sometimes it depends on the on the on the on our field. We 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 can mix uh, work in, at the office and. It's about working, as we say in Italy, or work from home. Uh, the way we uh, we use public transportation, the way, the way we, we do everything. So it's the, the moment we need to uh, think again how our cities, our cities. So and this is only part of the deal because there are much more to that. Uh, but uh, thanks again. Um, why? Uh, a new digital deal. This is the title of your book, but why that? Well, first of all, Roberto, thank you so much for inviting me and having me in your show. It's a wonderful thing to be here. Uh, Flavia, very good to see you again. Um, you look bright and shiny. You look very healthy. Good to see you. Um, look, Roberto, uh, we've been in an era of digitalization for quite a while. We've seen digital technologies come into our lives, both professional and private, and also apply to our communities, our cities, our regions, our villages, and obviously our countries. And for much of that time, we have experienced much of that growth, uh, much of that development as highly positive. And there has been a lot of positive output to all of that new digital innovation. However, you can also see, and it's something that I, when I originally wrote the first edition of the book, it was 2016. And it was only then that people started to kind of think, is this going in the right direction? Are we actually getting out of all of these technologies what we want? 
Now, I'm an optimist. I'm a tech optimist, but I'm also an optimist as to where all of these new technologies may bring us. But here's the warning. If we don't have a plan, if we don't see a good coming together of public sector, private sector, citizens, academia, to actually build a plan as to what we want with all of those innovations, then we may not actually harvest all the good stuff that we may get out of digital. In fact, it may come to hurt us, and we see some of that happen already. The challenge, Roberto, is that these technologies have been emerging at a faster pace than our ability to build a plan, than our ability to regulate. And that's a challenge. That's a real challenge. Um, I would want to compare it to being on a wild river in a canoe, but without the ability to steer. You can just go very fast, but at one point there's going to be this rock in the middle of the river, and then you have a real challenge. You're going to crash into that rock. Or you decide that you can actually steer the boat, but then you need a plan. You need the mechanisms to actually steer the boat. This is the call out of the book. And just like a few minutes, that's what a new digital deal is all about. Now, there's a lot of detail to it, a lot of detail, philosophical, practical, economic, from a regulatory perspective. Uh, but I won't go into detail at this right now in your perfectly simple first question. But I hope this kind of um, encapsulates for your audience best as to what the book is all about. Well, may I ask, you... may I ask, may I ask yes, something, please? Please go on. So uh, first of all, very nice to see you again, Bas, even if it is far away, but uh, short, easy to see at least. So you, you said we need a plan, right? Yes. Uh, what, what do you suggest to our new government for that? Which kind of plan would you say to them? So the to first thing is, is to start out with the how, uh, and then we can start, then we can end up with the when. Uh, because the how very much define, will define the nature of the plan. Um, I think that it, what is very important is that governments stop to think that they will be able to think all of the solutions just perfectly well by themselves. They need to move out of their offices and they will have to come with outside in type of answers because we live in a fast changing society and you cannot just come up with plans for technology and, and, and inclusion plans if you don't know what people out there would want with all of this. You need to actually bring in multiple stakeholders. You need to talk and listen to citizens, to businesses, academia, schools, hospitals, the people around you, your neighbors. Once you have done that, can you, can you go back inside your office and start build a plan? Even then, once you're back in your office, you again need to build a task force of those people and partners, public and private and academia alike, that can help you build the plan together. No one, Flavia and Roberto, no one is going to do this alone. Government cannot do this alone. Private sector cannot do this alone. Academia cannot do this alone. Please unite. Once you have done that, you will have to define a moonshot. This cannot be about incrementalism. The, these things are moving too fast. They're moving so fast that if you don't come up with a moonshot type of plan as to what you want your country to be in 10 years from now, you're going to be in trouble. Many of our beautiful old cultured countries are already facing a backlash of not having built a plan 20 years ago mm. or 10 years ago. Now, okay. let's stop complaining. Let's yeah. stop complaining. There, I'll be, I'll be done a little bit. I'll be done in one minute. No, no, there's no. An Af <laughs> there's an African saying. There's an African saying. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Yeah. The second best time is now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's build it. And, 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 and I think I've just provided the ingredients as to where to start with this. Can we sign yeah. it? No, <laughs> <laughs> I can start. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 we, we can settle for it. I'm all being. Okay, so now you go. Flavia, please. No, go. no, it's just, just a question if we can sign what he said, because I agree totally from the first to the last uh, word. So 
can we sign it and then bring it uh, to our government and say, okay, listen, multiple stakeholders, uh, make a task force and, and let's stop complaining. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I think we could do that, uh, but I think to make it actionable and, and, and easy to communicate, Flavia, what might be a good idea is if uh, um, you yourself, your university, an organization like TSAI, the Smart City Association Italy, which is growing and doing a very good job, an organization like Italy and Partners, uh, another university like Politecnico Milano, I mean, they're, they're very, very good in this space. If all of these come together and actually produce a manifesto for a new deal, and that should just be two pages, three pages, not a lot more, but articulate clearly in 10 or 15 or 20 points as to what the new prime minister and his cabinet should be doing. Well, Bas, we can do that, provided you are with us. Otherwise... I'll always support. I'll always be <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question now about you know about cities generally speaking because there was a lot of criticism you know this month about the city model itself you know regardless of smart city but you know it is it, a step before I mean cities as themselves because you know it was say that uh, they are not sustainable they are not affordable anymore uh, they are an old model. Uh, and in Italy, uh, in Italy, for example, we uh, discussed a lot. There was a lot of discussion about this kind of uh, regression, because I, I call it a regression, to the small towns uh, as in the Middle Ages. Uh, I personally, I don't like this, uh, you know, this kind of narrative, because for me, cities are there. To, to stay. I mean, it's not something we will get rid of uh, any 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 time. Uh, but uh, do you think there is? Um, I mean, um, uh, there is some structural change in the in the infrastructure. I mean, apart from the digital layer, if we go you know, one layer um, below that, do you think that it will be? In, some something, some change in the shape of cities, in the shape of the, you know, the, in the urban infrastructure. So, so it there's many answers to that question, it, and it's a complex. Well, the question sounds easy, but the answer has to be complex. Um, first of all, cities have been. I mean, if you go through the thousands year, thousands of years of cities there is a remarkable amount of similarities between all of these cities throughout the ages. It's not just Rome that carries the history of thousands of years from Damascus to, to, to um, 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 uh, old cities, royal cities in, in, in Cambodia to old cities in Mexico. There's a lot of similarities as to how cities have functioned, how they've evolved. And interestingly, they, they have often had innovation agendas. Uh, the Grand Empire and city of Angkor in Cambodia had a huge innovation agenda. Rome had an innovation agenda. We today have an innovation agenda. So all of that is not new. All of that has been with us for thousands of years. Also the function of cities, Cities have always been at the crossroads of knowledge exchange, exchange of ideas, cultures, exchange, exchange of values, insights, new perspectives, sources and capitals of education, exchange, trade. That has always been part of cities. But what has changed is that a larger group actually ended up living in cities. So whereas cities always had that function, for most of the time, more than 90% of people actually didn't live in cities. They lived in the countryside and that has changed. But something else has changed for digital is that all of these things that we typically associate with cities, modern services, dense entertainment, great choice of shopping, great choice of education, these typical urban services now get virtualized well beyond cities. We can now make many of these urban services time and place independent. 
So the way we experience and define things urban have greatly expanded beyond the physical city. In fact, if we make our digital deal smart and wise, then we make a new digital deal that is actually not just focused on physical cities, but greatly expands beyond them because that's been the trend anyhow. And people living outside the city do expect urban services. They do expect the same quality of education. They do expect the same access to online vendors that will allow them to buy a book or a present while they have a lockdown and need to stay indoors. All of these services have become accessible. What our task is that we continue to ensure that what we consider to be urban services are equally distributed across a country, across countryside, across smaller communities also, so that we're not creating new digital divides. So I'm not sure whether I answered your question well, but these things are all very much tied to the way we perceive cities today. Flavia, I know you have something to, to add to that. No, well, <laughs> Uh, there is so many services online now and uh, they can be shared. I mean, uh, uh, the municipality A can share together with the municipality B. Uh, the software to do that can be open so that can, mean, can be shared and reused by other administration. At least in Italy, we have norms saying that we should do that, but they don't. Uh, why and uh, what can we do? What, what, what can we do for, for forcing public administration in adopting this kind of ideas? And uh, as you said, working together, together, NGOs, uh, universities, and of course, public administration. Is there a way to push them uh, a gentle nudge in the right direction. It, um, look, there, I think the thing we need to convince our leaders of is what the price is of not doing it. There is a price of not doing it. There is a very large price to pay of not doing it. Where will Italy stand if you're not going to adopt a larger digitalization plan now. And, 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 and once people are aware that particular steps do need to be taken, then what I think is important is that, you, as I referred to the moonshot, you need to actually define what it is you want to achieve in 10 years from now, and then reverse engineer from that point on what it is you need to do now in order to get there in 10 years. Now, that's easy for me to say. That's very easy for me to say. It's very difficult to implement, but this is the start. There is quite frankly, not another starting point. And here's the thing that I think we should be mindful of. The, the fear that I have is people to continue to be stuck in incrementalism, to just make a small investment in digital innovation and believe it will be okay for the next two, three years. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. That will not bring the nation to the next level of advancement. Uh, you need to actually think beyond incrementalism and come up with the bigger plan. And that's why, that's why uh, Bas, you always talk about the moonshot approach. I mean, taking a big step forward and taking also a big risk as well. Yeah. Um, it, it, look, so several things. One of the reasons that I, I, love, I love to use the word moonshot right now is that there is a little human uh, made satellite approaching Mars right now in about yeah, today, three yeah. minutes. It's going to land. So that's not a moonshot, it's a Mars shot. But, you know, thank you, science, for doing that. Wonderful. Um, but yes, a moonshot comes with risks. But you know what? Any innovation can blow up in your face. That is the very nature of the journey of innovation. If you're not prepared to go down that road, 
then be prepared to be stuck in history and the present forever. Can I can I say something about that, Bas? Because you are maybe suggesting that we need to plan, you know, forward, but forward, not I mean, not not just for the next three years, but for the next twenty years, isn't it? And is that the case? But it, I mean, this could imply that we need a different kind of government. I mean, maybe China is good at that because they can plan well in advance. Whilst we we are not that good at plan because we have you know a different government system and we also have a multi-layer system because there is the EU as you as you know <laughs> well <laughs> way better than me but there is the EU there, there are the member states there are the regions then there are the local I mean, municipalities the cities themselves so I mean how can we uh, plan that much in advance whilst not you know becoming like like China for example so first, let me challenge you on your assumption that we cannot achieve anything like that. And next, there is the question as to what it is, is it exactly then how we should be achieving it. But I challenge you on the assumption that China is somehow better off. The thing is, yes, they can plan centrally quite well. That is obviously a benefit to their system. But there is a downside to that. There is a price to pay for that. How much citizen input are you going to get? And there's another thing which comes with the culture of digitalization, which is the nature of distributedness, networkedness. And if you look at our modern culture, it comes with peer to peer production, peer to peer collaboration. Uh, so many young people, they build businesses, they gather insights, learn purely through networks. There is the expectations of young people and young citizens, but also some of the older people alike, that their voices will be heard and not just through the classical political means or through classical political parties, but through digital platforms and they want to be heard. They're going to get angry if they're not going to get heard. This is when people get onto the streets and say, what's wrong with you in government? We want to be heard. This is part of the new networked culture. These people have been emancipated. To look at them as a problem would be a mistake. To look at them as the building blocks to build a new networked type of organization that will help you build government of tomorrow, that would be, to me, from my perspective, the way forward. Now, so, and I know that sounds very academic, but if you look at how many networked decision-making plans can really allow for people to make a perfectly well-informed decision as to particular decisions that need to be made in their village. Uh, so that old oak tree died on the central square. What are we gonna do with that central square? Are we gonna create a merry-go-round for children or are we gonna build a little terrace with a cafe and you know some wine bar? you can actually have that local digital platform where people will decide. People are glad to collaborate. The citizen as a censor, the citizen as a decision maker. It puts government out of the central business of governing and it puts government on the edge. That is potentially very much the future of government, but it needs to step back and listen to what is being said at the center, which is citizens themselves. Now, I doubt I challenge the Chinese leaders whether they are prepared to go down that route because I sincerely do not think they are. So totally. our That's ideals, totally. our, our ideals, our liberal ideals, our, our, our democratic ideals perhaps are still good, but they do need to be reframed within the, within the let's say, the, 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 the conditions of the networked society. So that's one thing. The second thing is that if then you need to build that long-term plan, being an open democracy, first of all, I think by actually going out into the world and build some type of a consensus around a particular plan and idea, that may provide you with the leverage and support to take it further. But what is very important in practical points is that most of the urban innovation agendas and the digitalization strategies for entire regions have done so much better if they have been approved and been provided with mandate and budget for a period that lasts longer than one election cycle. 
because otherwise it tends to be tied to one political color and it gets shot down at the moment a new government steps in. Now that is one thing to be avoided. Those communities that have fared best and most successful within open democratic societies are those that build a plan that lasts longer with mandate and budget beyond one election cycle. And that's just one of the ingredients that will help you see through the day. I have, a, I have another question that, that was point, but I will um, now I would like uh, to Flavia maybe to say something because yes, just, yeah, just another question, me too, uh, because there is no word. Just what what about the digital divide, not just the infrastructural one? Because okay, you said the digital is there. You should we should make together a deal, right? Uh, but there is a digital divide, which is not just infrastructure, it is uh, sociological, economical, blah, blah, blah. If you look at the DAISY report, you see that Italy is the last one for internet and digital skills. So what can we do? What is your suggestion in that field? So I, I, I think, um, first of all, is to understand what, the, what today's digital divides look like. First of all, I, I put a little S there, it's plural. It's not one divide, there are several divides, several digital divides. The first time we started to use that word was in the 1990s. And it was meant to differentiate between people that were online or offline. Generally young versus old people. That was, that was more than, it was 25 years ago. It's, it sounds like a long time ago, but that was just 25 years ago. Now we're living with a lot more digital divides. Yes, the old digital divide still applies. Some people are simply not online. And that's an infrastructure thing and it can be solved. That's actually the easy part. Now, what is much more difficult is to bring people on board that are under the assumption that they're online because they have a mobile phone and they chat and they go on Facebook they're under the assumption that they're online, but are being left out of a culture of aspirations, ideas, and entrepreneurship that belong to the digital era, but that they feel that they're left out of, that they believe is not a world that belongs to them. And this is a massive challenge. This is a massive challenge. I would say that the problems that you find in the United States with so many people that are at in, in a deep state of fear, afraid of not belonging to a brave tomorrow, that, that the jobs of tomorrow will not belong to them, that they will not be able to see their children succeed because they have not been tied to that larger world of digitalization. So they may have, they may have a smartphone and yes, they go on Facebook, but they're left out of that culture. So this is a much more dramatic a much more challenging divide and it's got nothing to do with technology and it's got everything to do with education and the social imbalances in society. Now, what do you do about it? First, you need to look at education, 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 education. You need to go, you know, and the teachers are not just going to solve the problem because generally the teachers can be part of the problem. You actually have to put children in a room where they do the better jobs themselves, build peer groups and learn the way they learn on schools in Finland. That is collaborative projects where they work in those peer groups, one person will be better in French, the other one will be better in mathematics, the other one will be in history, and they're working on an assignment together. They're going to build this digitally. And as they go through the education, the teacher is a coach and their skills, implicit and explicit in a digital world becomes an automatic, is, is, is something that, that evolves. So this is something which you can actually build into the culture of your education. Stop the educational culture, which is still too predominant in many European cultures where teachers talk and then the children listen. That, that culture belongs to the past, believe me. So that is one thing, education. But it doesn't just start and end with children. It's also about the people are adults today. They should be allowed to, to educate. L lifelong learning is more important than ever. Give people a chance to actually go back and learn. This is something where central government can do something. This is something you can fund. 
if I were a major government entity in Italy and I was going to receive funds from Brussels because Brussels is going to send all of these build back better funds, then I would invest it in part, not just in technology. I would invest it in education and not just education for children, but also education for adults. Make lifelong learning a mission and make sure that that mission ties into that society that you want to build in 10 years from now. Yeah, about education and about, you know, also the education culture, how, how is it different, you know, from country to country, even in, in, even in Europe. Uh, I remember that uh, our, you know, last premier spokesman uh, in his last book, in his only book, uh, tells that when he was a child in Germany, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the teacher's desk, was at the same level uh, as the, you know, the, 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 the kids. Desk. But when he went back to Italy, because he was, he was, he was Italian in the end, uh, he found out that the teacher's desk was much higher. And there was this divide, you know, between the, the teacher and, uh, and, and, and the kids. And so this, this old way of, you know, uh, providing education which is something we still have ingrained in Italy is uh, maybe not everywhere, but we still have this kind of, you know, uh, model, but even at the university, or maybe especially so at the university. But that's not the case in, you know, in other uh, member states of the, of the EU. But going back for just for a sec to the governance and um, planning stuff, which is my king, so to say. Uh, uh, is that, do, do you think that uh, because um, because of course to be to allocate resources in, in an efficient way, we need to in some way decouple. Uh, planning from you know the the uh, electoral agenda. Uh, do you think that there should be some kind of independent agency, uh, something like you know the, a central bank, but for innovation, not a bank. I mean, I mean, a, a, a public body in charge of innovation, but uh, not on an electoral basis in order to to to, to, to plan things. I I I I think you cannot do without. I, I think you need some type of entity that is going to be entrusted, mandated to actually orchestrate the job. But I use the word orchestrate, not lead, orchestrate. Because if this is just another department that is going to have a big hotshot director general with a budget in a classic way, uh, you're, you're not going to get that very far. The point is this, Roberto, this is typically something that gets underestimated. When people hear digitalization, think pe too many people think, oh, that's about IT, it's about technology. So we need an IT leader that will be in charge. But no, digitalization is only in small part about technology. For the rest, it's about change of culture. It's about the change of business models. It's about a change of regulatory environments. It's about a change in education. That is something that applies to all domains in government. It applies to economic affairs. It applies to mobility. It applies to energy. It applies to youth and culture. It applies to all of these domains. So if you look at the governance structures that have worked best around the world, you can see that it's always been organized in a very horizontal way across those departments and ministries. And then with an expanded ecosystem well beyond government. A great example that I always like to quote is, um, is Singapore. Singapore is a, is a little bit an, an exception and an oddity because it's a nation state, but also it's a city, it's an island. But still, they have got this great example. What they did is they built the smart nation team. The smart nation team directs reports directly to the prime minister, um, which is good. It's very good that you know they have that exposure and that they get to 
talk and di report directly to the prime minister, but they do not outrank the ministers or the department directors, but they have veto power. They have veto power to veto stupid procurements. So if there is a ministry that comes with a stupid idea or a stupid procurement, this smart nation team can actually veto it. Now, that's an example of governance, which is actually very, very smart and it's working extremely well. There's plenty of other places where they have done very similar initiatives, where they've built this governance across departments and ministries in a horizontal way. Uh, plenty of cities that have done that well. Um, cities like Tampere in Finland, um, Reykjavik, Iceland. But also if you think of close, very close to my home, the city of Amsterdam, they have a chief technology officer but that chief technology officer has about 100 people, not so much as direct reports, but dotted line people reporting in from all the different departments. So you built this orchestration machine throughout the entire apparatus. That's a much smarter way of organizing this. And then as a simple answer to your question, do we need it? Absolutely, you cannot do it without it. You're not gonna get there without it. Oh, yeah, do you think that in, I mean, your experience as a, I mean, city council, the city council so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to the to the innovation. I mean, you, because you were you were something that did the CIO. I mean, the chief innovation officer. Yeah, so, in some in some sense, yes. Yeah. So, do you think that this was something you could actually? Uh, yeah, was talking about about Finland. Uh, but in the days you report, Finland is in the beginning and Italy is the last one. So, so I think that first, what you said before, education, education, education. Yes, this is the first issue, even, even if in my experience in Rome, I believe that, uh, yeah, we had a lot of uh, services online, but people didn't use it. Why? Are they made in the wrong way or just because they are not able in some sense to use it. Talking about the divide, as you said, of course, there is a, the infrastructural one, so the, the connection, but in the pandemic era, era, we saw a lot of people not able to use technologies, even if they had a computer and, and, a, and a, a net, of course. But uh, teacher, as you said, they are old and not, uh, yet, not yet, I would say, open to the digital uh, because they studied in, a, in another era. Uh, they are not used to it. They are not used to even protect themselves, people, from, you know, cyber something attack. It will be yeah. uh, something essential to do. Yeah, say, it, please. No, no, I mean, uh, I agree about uh, going back for a moment to, uh, to what, what Bas was was saying about you know the Amsterdam model, this CAO and then this orchestration layer. So do you think that something like that could was actually achieved in all could be achieved? Uh, the, uh, I mean, it, 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 there is too much difference in scale or something like that. I don't... If you think about that, we have in Italy the uh, RTD, the responsible for digital transition. Uh, it should be. In, in theory, any single administration should have it and is responsible for anything concerning the digital transition. Uh, there is in Rome, and unfortunately there is because it's very keen on that, so it can do something strong, but, and so is able to uh, control in some sense and, and give a hint to any single other director in this public administration, even the, the general director, which is on top of him, but he can uh, get information and order if even from the RTD, from the digital uh, transition uh, responsible. This is from the structural point of view, but the politicians, they do whatever they want, because still education, education, education is also for them and the, the capacity to listen and other, well, I'm writing, I'm trying to write your manifesto. Uh, so far, I, I have five things. The first one is education, education, education. The second one 
is involving all the stakeholders, right? The third one is listen. And I will say three times, listen, 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 also this one, because it's essential. Uh, and then the agency just to orchestrate, it will be, it will be probably the right, the right thing to do, but who give them the direction? The politicians, right? So they must be able to do it. They must know in which direction they want to go. And, 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 and there is the real, so I agree, exactly, all the things that you said, I, I, I fundamentally agree. The thing is that most politicians, quite frankly, are old school and will be not rich on ideas as to how to take this agenda forward. Uh, they are, most of them will be rooted in, in a deeply old world and old expectations, which does not help. Uh, however, what does help is if there is at least one or two or three elected politicians that do get this, that understand that this is a matter of orchestration, not just top-down leadership, that this is a matter of listening and listening differently from what you were used to and not just running a hierarchy. That change of culture is always going to be slow. It does not happen overnight, but it is emerging. And, and I, I do think that... Um, um, there, there are an increasing amount of leaders in Italy also that, that do get this. Um, uh, I also think that there is the space and hopefully also the daring minds among politicians and elected leaders to not carve out an incremental agenda, but to carve out something that resembles a moonshot. Uh, to be the digital Jack Kennedy of, of Italy, if you will. I can't think of another better name. Uh, and to have to be that aspirational and call it out uh, and, and give other elected officials a sense of direction as to where this should go and where this can go. Because there's one thing that reinforces incrementalism and slow progress, which is defeatism if you will. That is the sense that I often hear among Italian friends that things will never happen as they shoot in Italy, that things will always be too slow. And that can be self-defeating. Um, uh, at one point, it is time to produce that manifesto and be bold about it. There are the ingredients, there's a lot of ingredients in order to get this right. And there is a lot of capable leadership in the country. And there is so much great infrastructure and there is so much great enterprise. Many of the members of the Smart City Association Italy, they are head on, they are ready to invest. They are ready to make this happen. There is a lot of reason to be extremely hopeful about carrying this forward. Basha, and talking about pitfalls, because you do in your books, I mean, the top five. Well, it's very, very difficult to, 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 to be stuck with only five. Um, yeah, I know, but... <laughs> first of all, is to not get hung up on the name Smart City. I, I just don't like the term. Uh, and everyone that knows me knows that I don't like the term because me this too. is not just about I cities. hate it. I, 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 Absolutely. It, it's not just about cities. It's also about villages. It's also about countryside. It's about all of us. So it must be inclusive from day one. At the moment, you're going to focus on cities only. You're creating a new digital divide. It shouldn't happen. So the other thing is smart. What is smart? How do you measure smart? And if you're not smart, are you stupid? I mean, it's, 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 it's a nonsensical type of term. But that said, I mean, for lack of a better term, we can kind of work with smarter communities because smarter says it's not, there's no end state. And communities means it can be a city, can be a village, can be a region, can be a country even. So, you know, we, but don't get hung up the word. That's one. Two, don't focus on technology only. Technology is important. Those digital technologies are part of the engine, but it's only a small part of the equation. Your strategy, again, and I mentioned this before, it's about education, it's about modern policy, it's about inclusion, it's about citizen engagement, all of these things, regulations, agile regulations. Um, that is what digitalization is all about. And so do not just focus on technologies and please, 
do not think you're smart just because you got two or three pilots with some sensors or some smart lights or some smart parking spots, because that is not the way to get smart. You may derive some learnings from it, fine. But it's just a great showcase for the local newspaper that your mayor is smart too. No, it's not smart. Get beyond pilots, come with a real plan, please. So beyond, so that's, that's really an important one. Um, a third fun one is that you really build a vision. And a vision is, and what people often get wrong is that people think that a vision is a marketing movie or a great PowerPoint. Unfortunately, that's not the case. That means you've not been listening. You've not been going out. So the pitfall is not listening enough. So all of these things are, 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 are in very important examples of, of, of major pitfalls that, that people have experienced. Um, another thing is to believe that anyone can do this alone. Um, there has been the reliance on technology companies somehow creating this next installment of human endeavor. Nope, they can't. I used to work for one, they couldn't. Other technology companies, they couldn't. So that's been a massive, massive challenge. But then government cannot do this alone either. And big enterprise also needs small enterprise and startups because they can often be much more disruptive than large enterprise. They come up with genuine innovation, not just some linear innovation. So you need public, you need private, you need acad academia, you need citizens, you need NGOs coming together. Ex ex just expect you will not be able to do this alone. That's not a weakness, that's your strength. And, 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 and so this is a fundamentally important one. Another one is also tied to the reliance on private sector and technology company, which is that if I procure this beautiful solution pitched to me in a great PowerPoint by some technology company, I'll be smart. But then there's the risk. Some of it may work and some of it may work very well, but you may now have stepped into a proprietary pitfall. The machinery you've bought only talks to other machinery of that same vendor. And the data that you hope to obtain may be stuck in the solution of that vendor and you may not even be the owner of that data. So to have open, open, open access, open design, um, um, uh, um, uh, software, um, infrastructure designs will greatly help you to create an environment that is truly open and where solutions are actually interoperable. So pitfall, do not step into proprietary pitfalls. Of course you work with private sector, but set the terms. If you're gonna procure, if you're gonna set up the RFP, the request for procurement or the request for information, determine the level of openness and interoperability that you need to have out of all of that. Because if you don't, you offer a finger and they'll grab your hand. So be sharp about that. Be sharp, educate yourself. So um, uh, these are some of the, of, the, of the pitfalls. Another pitfall, now, now you got me going. Another pitfall is that you have leaders, civil servants that simply do not understand, even at a rudimentary level, things that are digital, not just a PC or a piece of software, yeah. but also how, how algorithms work. Now, imagine you I mean, are a civil most servant. Most of them in Italy, most, yeah. if not all of them. Oh, but, but, <laughs> here's, well, of course, but. You know, but, but here's the point. You are a civil servant in a medium-sized municipality and you're dealing with a lot of data that is privacy sensitive. But if you do not know how an algorithm works, how can you be held accountable for doing a good job securing the privacy of that data? You, again, education comes into place, but now it's about upskilling, not about young kids, but it's about sending civil servants back to school to actually understand data analytics algorithms, not to become data engineers, not needed, but to actually look at their old jobs through fresh eyes yeah. and understand some of the rudiments. Now, some governments have done this. They have literally sent 30% of their workforce back to school for two week data analytics course. So at least they have a basic understanding as to what it is that they're doing. To do these old jobs in a new era, uneducated is a, is a recipe for disaster. So it's another pitfall there. I mean, so uh, is this enough for now? 
or do you want me to continue? <laughs> no, no, yeah. we, we, we can go all the way to 10 if you want, but uh, <laughs> because, you, you know, I, I, I'm getting a little bit depressed because, you know, I think that most of these scenarios are actually what, what, what is happening right now in Italy, but not only in Italy. And for example, well, we do have most of the people in charge who do not understand not computers, of course. They don't understand what digital means, processes, data, interoperability. Uh, and yeah, that's 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 uh, you know that that's a problem because of course we can work on you know new the, the, the young, but it takes time for them you know to go up the the ladder. And uh, so in the meantime, <laughs> we are stuck. Uh, maybe, but if you if we're going to get all of these funds out of Brussels, and we're going to do to build back better, one of the things is to invest in education, not just for the young, but in education for the workforces that are now populating government entities. It would be such a good investment. It would be such a wonderful investment. And Flavia, can I ask you, are yeah. you going to build a program where you're going to actually teach people how to build innovation strategies for public purpose. Listen, Basso, I had the same question for you. The question was, would you make a lesson to our politicians? We could organize it. We got a deal. We're we can do it, it together. <laughs> absolutely. Do it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we are ready to do it. But, Let's do it. All right. but so, the problem is we, are, we are ready with the program, with the syllabus, with your book, with all our ideas, all our experience. They will never buy it. I mean, they will never go there, even if it is for free, because they do not have the awareness of the, the needs to know it. When you said before, you said two great things. One is how to measure smartness. It is not measurable. So why do you talk about measure uh, smartness? And another thing is that you said data analytic course. I would say, Yes, please. But um, yeah, in Italy, there is not, there is not a, 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 the culture of, of data. I don't know why. Can I add something? Uh, sure. In, 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 sure. Italy, in Italy, most of you know, the people in charge in the public, uh, in public sector are lawyers, which is not to say that lawyers are not needed, but they are I mean, all, all of them are lawyers, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, it happened to me, for example, when I worked as, uh, as a consultant at um, the foreign ministry in Italy, uh, the head of unit, uh, of the technical unit of the ministry was a, was a lawyer. Uh, the same, same thing for the Chamber of Deputies, the, the actual uh, head of the uh, digital sector, the CTO of the Chamber of Deputies, is, is, is uh, as, uh, as, as uh, I mean, a, a, a policy, you know, policy making background. Well, they, they, they may be, they may be very good. Uh, I mean, their their job. I don't doubt that, but they don't know what. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the issues and pitfalls and everything with. Digital. Th that's why uh, that's why we need a task force with all the stakeholders. Among the stakeholders, there are many different competences because you, as a, a university, has a technical competences. You, as a lawyer, you have a, a legal competence, which is essential. Both. So together, we can do something better. Together, together, together. Three times also this one. We should say. Right. And, and I, I think that's the way to go, Flavia, because you and I both see the need for that education and we could build that program. But there also needs to be at the same time a task force of kinds that provides a sense of direction, vision and mandate that encourages people and their own peers to actually go through these type of education and training. So I agree with you. There is a need for such training. But if you just go out there and say, we have this training, 
then that's not going to be good enough. And if you have a concerted effort of people agreeing that this is the way to go, you may not reach everyone, but you're going to reach a significant group of people beyond the top 10% innovative leaders, because we know them. We, we all know them. The, the leaders in Milan and Rome and and in, 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 in Brescia, and, and there is a lot of good people, and they're great innovative leaders, but we need to think beyond those 10%. We need to think of the next 40% of people that say, I'm ready to listen to you. I'm not convinced yet, but I'm ready to listen to you. Because if you bring that, that group of people on board, then you're beyond the 50% mark. Then you can start to build. And, 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 and I think we are collectively at a crossroads where we have to define how we're going to bring in that next 40% of leadership to think through along those lines, to, to be on board for, along those lines, to bring their teams on board of educational programs that will be dedicated on this journey. It can, and that I think can be done. Lars, I have a last question for you. Maybe it's a little out of our comfort zone, but I'll try all the same uh, to phrase it this in this way, uh, which is the role of you know, global financial flows uh, in the shaping of, you know, of the new cities? Because, for example, uh, I think of Rotterdam. No, after Brexit, it is becoming you know the most important hub, probably. Uh, I mean, same level as Frankfurt, or, or even you know uh, at, a, at a higher level, most important hub uh, in Europe as far as finance is concerned. Uh, do you think that this is something we can tap into, uh, or it's you know something we are not interested in? I actually, sorry. Please go ahead. No, 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 it's no, no, it's it's over. Thank you. So, so I, 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 I actually would almost flip the question. What is it that you're going to do in order to prepare for an environment which is well entrenched into the future, that is sufficiently well digitalized, that has the ability to attract attract global talent because talent, yeah, apart from COVID nineteen and people being locked down. But apart from the, the pandemic, talent is hugely mobile these days. It travels from London to Berlin to wherever. Your ability to provide modern infrastructure, attract talent, have a culture which is environmentally friendly, sustainable housing that is attractive from a cultural perspective, from an art perspective. Those are the cities that thrive best. Cities compete more than ever. Cities have always competed. Genoa versus Italy uh, in the golden age. That's already, that, it was happening at that time. But now they compete even more. So just a small bit of Brexit already changes the environment as to where London is sitting on the global landscape completely. And yes, a city like Amsterdam and Frankfurt have been benefiting from that up to a point. Uh, but they benefit because also they are able to create an environment which is digital, which is green, which is attractive, and they're able to attract a huge amount of startups, for instance. The, 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 the amount of startups that now land in, in a place like Amsterdam is just incredible. And they don't just go there because Amsterdam seems hip. It's because so many other things are in good order. Now that's how you build a modern dynamic leading city. That's how you evolve. And then also the financial flows start to follow. So this is where I flip the question. Make sure you have that vision for your community. Make sure you're on the right side of the paradigm shift that we're currently living. Make sure that you have all of these things in order. And then you also see more business coming to your community. Uh, this is something that can be done. And it's actually surprising how much can be done in a relatively short amount of time. Thank you, very clear. Uh, I don't know if Flavia has something to add. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. It's uh, okay. Just, just a hope for the future. Yeah, <laughs> let's, you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
But uh, as you know, we are in the middle of you know a uh, uh, you know a, a complete. Uh, well, I don't know if it's really complete because most of a, a lot a lot of the you know people who were there before or in previous years are now coming back again you know uh, under the limelight. But anyway, uh, all, everything is changing in Italy because the government is changing and also. Uh, the um, Rome City Council is going to uh, is going to change in the next month. So we are you know, at, at first roads. So, but thank you so much for you know, for your time. It was very insightful to talk to you, and we hope to be able to organize. We have a deal, so <laughs> yes, get, uh, you know, another meeting in the coming weeks or months. Let's certainly do that. And in the meantime, Flavia, if I can help you on the uh, manifesto, let me know. Yes, of course, we will. We will. We will do it together. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you again. Thank you. Speak soon. Bye. Have a nice night. Have a nice night. Bye.